नमस्कार लेट मी ऑल्सो स्टार्ट बाय थैंकिंग मयंक भाई मंदा बेन माय सिस्टर पुष्पा बेन एंड ऑल द डिस्टिंग गेस्ट हु आर हियर uh i see that the offline programs have begun and it's a pleasure to see this uh, small little congregation which will of course be warm and very interactive which uh, people like us who are joining online would miss kiran has kiran bhai as usual has been very very generous with his comments to the predecessor and the successor in the uh, session speaker but i must tell you that i'm just not saying this because he said so but he's a brilliant economist uh among the uh, regional and national level he has done a good analysis and presented to you uh, a picture whereby he has generically analyzed the macro level scene and said that how the inequality has potential to decline over time if we the governance is good and we do the proper investments in both public and private sector in education and health that's a wonderful learning that we should have from a professor of economics uh, having said that i will proceed only on that and begin from this since the topic we are discussing is covid and related to covid inequality and poverty generally and in the country and how it is going to impact uh, moving towards the sustainable development goals with respect to inequality and poverty at the outset i think it's understood and admitted now and it will further come by way of uh, my friend economists and others who will work on this and produce lawrence curves not only for this country and the region but maybe also internationally and find that economic inequality as it is measured by the lawrence curve has skewed and increased and there is a reason for that and definitely in india also there are anecdotal evidences which tell us that inequality is likely to increase as covid settles down third wave after third wave or whenever the economy comes back for this period i think many analysis will come it is too early to say intuitively it appears that inequality is going to increase to an extent now whether it is faster than otherwise in the normal situation non covid situation is difficult to say however covid did have a dent and impact on inequality and it will increase reasons we all know and i will also discuss some poverty of course well when we understand poverty we do understand that there is destitution poverty incidental poverty and structural poverty i think 90 onwards 1990 onwards when we opened up we brought the privatization liberalization and globalization there was definitely a move towards reducing the poverty in the country and we did note that significant levels of poverty came down in this country as well because let us restrict it to our own country this is known as structural poverty so we impacted on structural poverty covid is an incidence and incidental poverty is like flood drought and severe pandemics epidemics are known to impact economies because the labor force is affected production is affected and therefore you suffer because your gdp falls and when gdp falls obviously the share of this gdp which goes to the poorest of the poor who are either on threshold or below that or above that, little above that do take this impact and fall into poverty we have seen how laborers migrated back how the economy was completely closed we have a large informal sector where the employment is day to day and if you don't work for the day you don't get food because you can't buy food we all tried civil society came forward state came forward to provide reach food to people who were losing their jobs who lost their jobs for a longer period it went well for some time but it could not do so for the longer time and we saw that people who returned back to their villages despite increase in allocations of manrega all could not really survive well because they didn't get work so incidental poverty if whenever i don't know whether nsso have would do special rounds or it may have done whenever we'll see the results we will see that incident poverty levels for the time period would have gone up this is incidental poverty now it is against this backdrop obviously when poverty and inequality are adversely affected 
SDGs will be pushed back because by 2030, as someone was saying in the previous session where Professor Vidya Joshi was speaking, so I think somebody noted that uh, clearly, very clearly, admittedly, the SDGs, I think it is the person who was, who, who was part of consultation in a big way, he was saying that, yes, it is already admitted that in the developing and poor countries, SDG achievements by 2030 is almost an impossibility and it will be pushed back. This lesson we learned even without pandemic after the uh, MDGs, not surprising because of the nature and the structure of the economy we have. So this is not surprising. And I'm going to deal little with this and then shift why if we tried or if there is still a scope to try, what Gandhi was trying to tell us, do we have a potential and a scope to reduce inequality and poverty, not only in this country, but also among the humanity? It's a larger question. But coming back to present situation, for which Kiran Bhai presented a wonderful analysis, he did say that capital investment in health and education is, going, is the key how we will improve the human capital and in turn human capital will has a tendency to reduce the economic inequality, which is true, which is an understood fact in the developed countries. However, developed countries today also due to pandemic deny this. It has not happened even in developed countries. Evidence is already there. It is quite an anecdotal evidence, but I'm sure with data it will be supported that during pandemic, even in the developed countries, economic inequality has increased concentration. Governance is central point. And in governance, I think the basic issue is this. Humanity with all its brilliance and distilled wisdom has settled still on representative democracy. This is the best thing that humanity has ever achieved in the enlighten, enlightenment project of the humanity in the West, which began in the West, which is now of course spreading all over the humanity in every country. Representative democracy is something that we all appreciate and this is what where we have reached. However, representative democracy also has its, its limitation and political scientists will tell us what they are. Now, when the economy disengages from state-controlled economic systems to market regulated or market free market environment uh, economic systems, there is a danger and it's a real danger that concentration of power with majority, which we can see perhaps, I mean, in many countries, including this country, concentration of political power, representative democracy has this danger that you can consolidate your power even in representative democracy and the power becomes political power becomes concentrated. With this, when you have an open economy, it is open only in theory. In practice, I am fond of now saying that state oppresses and market manipulates. Now the state operation and market manipulation actually result in unholy nexus of the state and the market both. Now it is this cause that causes concentration of wealth in few hands. This let us understand very clear. COVID or no COVID? COVID, COVID is a name, basically any epidemic, pandemic. When temporarily allocations change fast, who can respond best? Small pharmaceutical companies or large pharmaceutical companies? Pharmaceutical giants are pharmaceutical pygmies. Obviously, pharmaceutical joint giants would be more advantageous in the short run to expand their capacities, produce more and charge monopoly prices, monopolistic prices on the product, both from the state and from the consumer, straight. This, has, this would happen. And all the backward and uh, forward linkage industries also would reap this kind of benefit. And whatever other infrastructure development takes place, even in there, the players are going to be those who can do it fast and those who have already got resources, they would do it faster. So they would amass more wealth. 
very simple. So this is where we are. So let's not be surprised. It is in design. It's not that some default has taken place. It's not. It's there by design that in this particular design, when there is concentration of political and economic power in representative democratic system or monarchy systems, more so Talibans would do it much more worse way than what a democracy does, because here at least you can ask some questions still, whatever we say about the curbing of freedom of expression, you still can afford to be a Desh Druhi and speak out if you are Nidar, Abhai, if you are practicing Abhai, you can do that. So, but the fact remains that this concentration of power is increasing and it is going to increase. So when this happens, obviously sustainable development goals, which are talking about sustainable development model, which has, you know, removal of poverty, hunger, distribution, decent living, consumption, uh, pollution reduction, all those kind of fancy uh, uh, development goals that we have set up, fancy or real, whatever we have set up are going to get a setback. This is one scenario which I have given and you can sort of uh, prove it from variety of things because if you what happened to labor you have seen so in the capital and labor relationships capital is better and labor is poorer so therefore labor gets exploited this is what is simply going to happen in the representative democracy what happened to the villages where i live i can just share that with you the first phase of covid pandemic went out through smooth we didn't have any cases, many cases. I shouldn't say any cases. We didn't have many cases. There was no scare. There was no hangama. There was lockdown, yes. This lockdown was in a time when agriculture season was over. There was grain in the house. They could survive. State also came forward. And I must admit that the state was able to reach food in this country, at least in the region where I live. It's a very, very backward region in a general sense of the term, as we all sort of see the background, but the ration came. But the purchasing power which is required to do non-ration things, and if there was some sickness, etc., etc., they had to, as, as soon as the first wave went, everything opened up a little partially, they all went, there is a rural to rural migration, a big way which takes place, we are adjacent to Maharashtra from Gujarat, and Maharashtra's uh, towns and big villages who do the grape vineyards, their exposure to Nashik city and Mumbai was very high. So the second phase, they all brought infection with them. And this infection was passed on straight to our laborers who had gone to work there. So second phase was very tough for us. We had almost in every house between April and May, we had cases, we had deaths. In our own small community where we work, we conducted our survey in 20,000 population and had 66 deaths, all of elders. It was a what, what we call a rational decision on the part of the, I mean, it doesn't look good that I'm saying this heartlessly, but it was a rational decision of the young people to decide that old people are in any case going to die. So don't spend after them. So they all, most of them, most of them out of 66, we, we guessed that 40, 45 should be the corona uh, deaths. And of that, only two or three had hospital admissions. Rest were allowed to die at home peacefully. Now, from here, and second, second uh, uh, random observation is that in many states like Bihar, I think I read somewhere, that in large numbers, parents have shifted their children from private school to public schools. Definitely poverty has hit them. There is an incident poverty case, right? So their capacities, the capacities of the poor, the cap human capital that we were trying to increase has received a significant dent and therefore we are low, we are down. This is going to remain like this. If we don't, what Professor Joshi was saying, talk about a paradigm shift. How prepared we are is a different question. The point is this, why did humanity missed this paradigm. It's a larger question. It's a larger philosophical question. It is the political economy. It is the politics, international politics, national politics, the understanding of the people and the wisdom of the humanity. Wisdom of the humanity still believes by and large 
that the best development creativity etc is possible under the free market system with minimal state or state helping to do it in terms of infrastructure blah 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 all that and of course with a dbt which we have come and settled at least that's a very rational approach rather than pushing out you know things to give them you do direct bank transfer put cash in the hands of people and they can at least choose and prefer whatever they want to buy which is a it which is a very rational and wise thing to do having said that there is there is going to be a severe limitation us was able to pass down 10000 dollar per person for the year and we can't do even 100 dollars that's a reality because we are a poor country so even dbt has severe limitation because state resources state uh, treasure also has a limited res cash resource with it fine what is the paradigm the paradigm that we are talking about i mean if you are talking if you are really ser really serious about the sustainable development that we are talking about then governance regional national and international governance through representative democracy and unholy nexus between business and polity forget about sustainable development goals you will achieve to some extent it i am not saying that you will not achieve something you will come up with any other un will come up with some other program which will now say not sustainable but sustainable sustainable or whatever they want from millennium development you can to sustainable and from sustainable survivable i don't know what they will do that's not the concern the concern is this what is it that this person who thought differently had to say which is mohandas karamchand gandhi this person had an idea which doesn't click with the rational intellect of the humanity especially the rational intellect in among social scientists economists policy makers bankers etc who who want to run the economy which is very really very important part of survival of the human society and human being individually as well as a society now Gandhi's paradigm, and of course, let us, if you look at his obiter dicta on what he wanted to say on inequality, I will very quickly read two, three lines. He says, "I want to bring about an equalization of status. My ideal is equal distribution, but so far as I can see, it is not to be realized. I therefore work for equitable distribution. The economics." true economics never militates against the highest ethical standard just as all true ethics to be worth its name must be at the same time also good economics an economics that in inculcates mammon worship and enables the strong to amass wealth at the expenses of the weak is a false and dismal science it spells death true economics on the other hand stands for social justice it promotes the good of all equality including the weakest and is indispensable for decent life now this is crux now in this crux what is the operational point the operational point he was offering was decentralized polity he talked about gram swaraj we don't want gram swaraj actually we don't want gram itself my friend young friend was already arguing what is the problem there are only 5% in the developed countries there are only 5% of the people who are relying on agriculture and allied sector subsidize them as much as state wants to and rest people are happy 95% people are happy urban society as i said market manipulates and therefore urban urban societies where there is a faceless society there is fraud deceit and greed it's there we all know it let's admit and economics cannot simply shake itself off the human values and say that we are value neutral we are rational because we are science and we are going to this analysis the reality is that these are the true things that really obtain in your real life so the real economics works with all this it works with ethical values management people are now breaking their heads to bring spirituality ethical standards in their management teaching and they are saying that managing self is more important if you learn how to manage yourself you will be able to manage others all this you know discourse is now coming and changing the management education as well but the central point which gandhi was trying to make was this decentralize it get to gram swaraj 
if in a face to face society participative democracy has to be slowly rakesh bhai was saying that so i was i, I just was about to say rakesh bhai has told the key words today or key sentences ki bhai yahi karna hai so what we are talking about is participative democracy is where you will make that sdg where you have to discuss about sustainable consumption and production that's the point i think that point was made in the earlier session by the moderator this sustainable consumption production debate can only happen where you have participative democracy participative democracy is where every adult is able to participate which can only happen in a unit like village and in that gandhi says once you have the decentralized polity roti kapda aur makan basic essentials and necessities will have to be worked out at that level there has to be choice preference and need generation at that level and need satisfaction want satisfaction at that level. so if you are able to do this and he is not saying that every village is atmanirbhar swavalamban doesn't mean that every village has to become swavalambi in everything no absolutely clear my idea of village swaraj gandhi says is that it's a complete republic independent of its neighbors for its own vital wants and yet interdependent for many others in which dependence is necessary he is not closed he can talk even about international trade the idea is the unit at which we must try the unit's viability whereby we achieve individual viability as well now it is here where i'll be able to take care of your poverty so what he is talking about is decentralized polity which is participative democracy participative democratic decisions will decide the production and consumption and choice and preferences ki bhai roti kapda aur makan main sirf neighbor se hi lu i'll take it from my neighbor i will not buy it i am the peter england shirt is very good but thank you let peter england england people should use i will buy my manu bhai shirt who is producing in the neighborhood good point that's bad economics but it is ethical economics bad economics in the conventional sense you will be dubbed as irrational but all that irrationality if it is added by point of ethics then it is a good economics which he wants to say that all good economics must be ethical and yet he would he is not allowing state to do any production gandhi is a free market person absolutely to be understood he is a free market person except that he is talking about decentralized production consumption systems which will be imposed by the community itself it's the community's choice there he brings in community's choice if you do this then what would have happened my farmers if they were roti kapda aur makan they were satisfied they would not have gone to the vineyards of nashik or to the town and they would not have brought covid with them as they were safe in first phase they would have been phase in second phase it's not only covid that i am talking about rural areas by gen by by general this thing rural areas the incidence was relatively less than the urban areas because urban areas are more dense where catching of infection is always fast or any infectious disease spreads faster in urban areas it's well known two curative practices were so exploitative in urban areas that even the middle class lost its savings this is true so if you look at this whole model then we have not given a chance to this gandhi's idea gandhi's paradigm of talking about participative democracy and decentralized production system and i can go on telling you swadeshi and all that and of course for the self rule that uh, professor joshi was talking about 11 vows only one or two is not everything is consistent you practice everything else and you are fine you should do that it's difficult but we will have to move towards that that itself solving the problem at that unitary level which is village you can then go on advancing at a higher level and achieving of sdgs whatever we are trying to do because what will happen is when you scale down your production to that level you are reducing fuel consumption fossil fuel con consumption to a large extent today i am getting rice from punjab in my ration shop why should i do that even in representative democracy we have been foolish running our pds system where punjab's rice is carried to this place which is uh, 1200 kilometers away my own person who has very good agrobiodiversity if i bought what they were eating 
then there is a price signal given to them where state is buying then the production can go up and there is no they are not disincentivized against the free paddy or the you know low price paddy which is highly subsidized come from punjab and given to me in a ration shop here do you see this point that even representative democracy there are some areas on which we can work if we really think about decentralization in this sense because we have to in any case transit but our problem is that our discourse is very clear we don't want to transform our villages we want to wait we are in transition not in the process of transformation transition is that all rural area should be vacated and as far as possible they must be dumped in urban areas that is the paradigm and that is the discourse beware let's be aware let's be clear do any amount of discussions you want to but if you don't shift this paradigm the larger discourse is this okay so if that is the larger discourse then as i said in the beginning there is very small possibility that covid's impact can be absorbed it will definitely increase inequality poverty will rise incidentally it may come back again to the same level but it will not go away it's an aspiration issue as well poverty today is not only roti ki poverty every everybody is eating some morsels but my people have started preferring what is coming in the packages so layers chips are more fancy for those 5 rupees they will not buy their grain and eat the choice is between this so what nutrition they get then you shout that there is purchasing capacity yet there is malnutrition there will be choices because that's the economy we are pushing we are great in food processing i am also guilty of that i process this in one district where i was saying value added value added value added value added so dirt added that's the position what we can do at local level we are trying to do at macro level use all the fossil fuel that we have and we want to transport that create pollution more pollution more expansion put more pesticides and uh, fertilizers synthetic fertilizers into farm kill the soil and all that we are landing ourselves into a soup which will continue so i'm sorry for this broader analysis but since you are talking about covid and sustainable development goals with respect to inequality and poverty i just try to connect things and if i have been able to do and sort of uh persuaded to think uh, especially those who are in the consultative process of pl planning at a macro level since we are going to continue in representative democracy for long if these things are brought even through even in this representative democracy like we did have panchayati raj institution revolution by the constitution amendments that we have if we are able to strictly practice this we we have a way of doing it and in that sense education will come into public sector at the village level and that village level education has to be vocational education gandhi's last gift was nai taleem he was working on hand head and heart all the three so heart education gave you values hand education gave you skill and head education gave you knowledge now this is what we want to really do and at village level this is well done because you have land you have livestock whatever your resource is locally you get skilled in that so that your productivity improves you are able to be a self employment or an entrepreneur within your own areas you don't have to really go out there are stories but this is where i think i will stop uh, of course i will be happy to respond to questions if any if i have exceeded my time uh, i'm sorry i mean i was not warned about it rakesh bhai has been perhaps liberal saying yaar bade professor ko rokte nahi hai to ghanti nahi bajai hogi baja dete to main chup ho jata thank you very much excellent sir excellent excellent <laughs> thank you so much and uh... since we have uh, only 10 minutes left to the lunch eh? so uh, any question if you want to address to dr ayangar or dr pandya please very good afternoon sir thank you so much for your wonderful address and uh, just this is question related to your talk um ayangar sir obviously and uh, your talk and previous talk as well there were the ekadash brath 
now you have talked about gandhian philosophy there are two things which I remembered in my mind one is the gandhi ji had advocated about the trusteeship this is directly related to the sustainable development goals 12 that is the consumer and the other things and one thing he always trust about that there should be the production by masses, not mass production. If we can correlate these things, what is your view, sir? We are ignoring the villages. We are ignoring the rural areas. Now we are seeing prosperity only in the urbanization. This is, this is not good at all. And we are doing willingly or unwilling on society. We are moving on societal path because if we are unable to stop the migration, if we are unable to create good things in village itself, I don't think we are doing good things. So please, your view, sir. Thank you so much, sir. You have said it. I think uh, because of the paucity of time, we had to limit things. But you are right when you talk about decentralized production systems or when you are in representative democracy, you continue to do that. There is concentration of wealth. Gandhi gives a theory. And which is, he says that this is my theory. Gandhi's only theoretical contribution all his life has been the principle of trusteeship. Principle of trusteeship brings in the point of ethics in economics as he wants to do in a theoretical framework where he says that under the capitalism and communism, there is violence. And for a non-violent society, he accepts that there is differences in abilities of individual, the inter-individual inter differences definitely will do concentration of wealth for those who are specially creative entrepreneur in that, which is fine. But the wealth that you create, he argues, is not, although it is your initiative and innovation, you are not, you cannot produce without the others. So therefore, in the profit, it's not enough, as we say in economics, to give to the factors of production and then reap the profit, he says that even profit is to be shared where human are involved. So you have given interest, you have given rent, you have given everything, you have given wages, but after that, you still have profit which also has to be shared with the society after keeping something for yourself, which may be definitely higher and according to your need and little luxury that you want to indulge in, but still, I, whether I don't know, I should say this, you cannot live in Antilia, a 27-story building where you have 10 story of parking for six people. You can't. And if one does that, if, the, if you can't persuade them to trusteeship, the action point, he said, is civil disobedience, asahakar, and Satyagraha. You are absolutely right. That becomes a political action. And in that process, Vinoba tried through his Bhudan. The only point was that Vinoba said, Main katla se nahi, kanun se nahi, karuna se chahata hun. I don't want out of murder, out of law, but out of compassion, Gandhi would have said, Main kartavya se mangta hun. He would have put it as a duty, and then that is where the Satyagraha would be. Bhumi Putra, Bhumi Dan, uh, Bhudan did not have that kind of Satyagraha, Gandhi would have added it. So maybe we would have gone a different way. The way is still open for us if we can do it. But you are right. Thank you so much. It is the principle. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anger. Uh, we have uh, questions. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, my name is Thomas from Vishwa Yuva Kendra. Uh, so you had in in your talk you had mentioned about participative democracy, uh, but and you mentioned in Gandhian times participative democracy was the way to go about. But today it's different times. It's Modi times. So do you do you actually think there is a participative democracy that can happen because democracy is only one day in five years that we actually have a say in what we do. 
Uh, yeah, Thomas, I've got your questions. There's no time, very short answer. There's no Gandhi, there's no Modi. I'm just trying designs. Gandhi's time also participative democracy may or no, may not be happening. Villages were more feudal at that time. Gandhi's approach was Gram Swaraj. He said that his constructive program was Gram Swaraj. And Gram Swaraj examples today also are there. It's happening in Garchiroli district. You can go to Mendalekha where you will find an interesting, uh, you know, Ek um, Nara hai. They say that Mumbai, Delhi, mein, Hamari Sarkar, Hamare Gao, mein, Hamhi Sarkar. Now, this is participative democracy and Gram Swaraj in the real sense. So, let's not worry about what the party is. Irrespective of the party, we have had representative democracy where concentration of power will continue. It's not this group, that group, this party, that party. No, it's not. In the party itself, somebody will be more powerful, somebody will be less powerful, somebody will be more open for internal democracy, somebody will not be. But the design itself I'm talking about is that representative democracy is still the best form that humanity has achieved, but it has limitations. Gandhi was saying, try participative democracy, which is where every adult can participate in the process that can happen at a smaller scale where the economy and polity and society, everything will have to be in a smaller scale. That is the point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your